Today I'm going to be walking through the process of making your own custom sky domes like this in Blender, and how to set them up in Godot. Now in game dev it's easy to just drop in a default procedural sky and call it a day, and while these generally give you some pretty decent lighting and I understand the temptation to leave it there, we can do so much more with our sky domes. And even if you're a complete beginner to Blender, I think you can make something like this with very little effort and time. It may look complex, but actually I threw this together in less than a couple hours. And while I'll focus mainly on this Final Fantasy-inspired megastructure for this video, there are so many possibilities with this technique. Epic fantasy landscapes, giant celestial bodies, and for those following me for the pixel art stuff, yes, you can do pixel art as well. So without further ado, let's jump right in. If you don't care about the modeling part, there will be timestamps below so you can skip ahead to the camera setup if that's what you're here for. Now like I said already, this model may look complex, but actually I'm making a really quick rough model here, because this is mostly for the sake of this tutorial, but I still think it holds up pretty well. And actually at the end of this video I'll be giving a download link if you want to use it in your game. Now for mega structures, in order to sell the scale of this thing, we're going to need lots of small scale detail, also known as Greeble. There are lots of Greeble model packs out there that you can use, but I wanted to keep this method free and not reliant on any models or add-ons. So a great alternative is displacement maps. By using a black and white image that represents height, we can add tons of detail to any surface with just a few clicks. I'm generating this random Greeble texture online with this cool little tool called Displacement X. You can just go to this site and play around with the sliders and keep hitting render until you get something kind of cool looking. I'd recommend turning on these sprite packs down here because that's where all these really cool patterns live. And when you find something you like, just hit download. Now, you'll probably want to generate a few different textures here for the sake of variety, but believe it or not, my scene just uses this one single texture because I'm lazy and I think it works perfectly fine. So now over in Blender, I just made a plane with a decent number of subdivisions on it, then further subdivided the mesh with a modifier. The subdivision modifier is great because you can have a lower number of subdivisions for your viewport, keeping things nice and performant, and then a higher number for your render. But you do want to start with a few subdivisions already on your mesh so that you don't need to turn this number up way too high. It also appears to be a little more performance in Blender if you start with a subdivided mesh and then use the modifier to get you the rest of the way. But that could just be my imagination. I'm not sure. Next I added a displace modifier here and added a new texture. And then in the textures property bin I loaded in that texture we just made. We can play with the strength till we're happy and adjust the subdivision levels until we have enough geometry to actually see our detail. We're going to want to bump up this number until we don't really see much change between the different levels, and then we'll use this number for the render subdivision levels. For the levels viewport, we can keep this fairly high until we start to notice a bit of a performance slowdown, and then we can lower it later, and it won't affect the final render. So now we can use this single piece to start building up our mega structure. First I wanted to make the plates that sit up above, so I added an array modifier, which just duplicates the mesh a certain number of times with an offset. That gives me a strip of detail that I can now wrap around into a disk shape. And this is where the simple deform modifier comes in, and this modifier is honestly confusing as hell. I'm sure if you've used it before you know what I mean. No matter how many times I've looked up tutorials on this thing, I always just end up playing with the settings until I get the desired results. But anyways, I use these settings to wrap the uh, strip into a disk shape. And now the cool thing about using this modifier stack is that I can go back and edit the original piece of geometry, you know, just this flat plane, and I can get completely different results as it works its way through the modifier stack. So I can scale this piece of geometry around to get like a thicker disk, or I can move individual edges around to get separations between the different sections. And I just played around with this till I found something that looked cool to me. So I gave it a bit of thickness, and then on the edges I kind of extruded it inwards so that it kind of insets itself. And then the 
bottom part I scaled in a bit so we have like a smaller section on the bottom and then it gets wider up on the top. And then when I was happy with that I added a second array to give it a sort of larger outer ring. And that's the upper plate mostly done. So I quickly added a sky here just to get a feel for how it might look in the end, but uh, I'll get back to that later. Just to stay on the topic of modeling, uh, next I started work on the central pillar, and I'm actually just using the exact same model, keeping most of the modifier stack, except you'll see in a sec I delete one of the arrays. And here I'm just rotating that plane 90 degrees so that it stands upright, and that's the base of our pillar done. I added another array here uh, with a fixed count of 3 and a relative offset on the z-axis of 1 to give three different sections to the pillar. But to give a little more complexity to our model, I uh, added some curved circles and positioned them around the pillar. If you go into the curves properties down under geometry, you can extrude the curves out a bit to give them a bit of thickness. And I wanted to make this look kind of like scaffolding almost, so I made some cubes and stretched them way out all the way up to the top and just positioned them around using another array. Uh, I added some other shorter duplicates of these poles up at the top by the plates just to give some random details that like stick out of the bottom and top a bit. This just helps a little to break up the repetition of that single texture that I'm using around the entire model. And then I placed two really thin but wide cylinders around the pillar to give it a couple platforms. And then I added some lights to duplicate around that middle section, which is another good way to break up the repetition, I think. You don't only need to use geometry to add detail to your object, you can also use lighting. And then for the smaller pillars, it's kind of more of the same, just playing with the array size and the thickness, and I gave it like an inner, thinner pillar with some thicker sleeves around the outside. For the material, it was really, really simple. Uh, most of the detail is already kind of taken care of by that displacement, but using the exact same texture, we can add some variation to the color and the roughness smoothness of the object that line up with those displaced details. So I just plugged the texture straight into the base color, I set metalness to 1, and then using that same texture plugged into a color ramp, I just played around with how rough the reflections are, black being a near perfect mirror reflection and white being a very rough blurry reflection. Now in the shader editor we can go to the world tab and this is where we made that sky earlier, but I'll walk you through that step now. So we can make this sky texture set to Nishida and play with the sun settings until you find some lighting that you like. Sun elevation and rotation are probably the two more, most important settings. And then you can adjust the overall brightness with the background node, the strength value here. Now you can see me switching to a panoramic camera here, but I'll get back to that explanation in a bit. Uh, first, to finish off our scene, I added some fog. So you can just make this really large cube that covers the entire structure and our whole scene, and add a new material with a principled volume shader uh, plugged into the volume output here. And then you can just play with the density and color. Usually it comes in like very, very dense and just blocks out all the light. So you have to set this pretty low. Honestly, nothing sells the massive scale like atmospheric fog. So I think this is in a pretty good spot and I'm gonna move on to rendering in just a sec but before that I wanted to take a moment to say yes I know this model is a unoptimized mess it's like super high poly not even centered proper properly there's floating details and geometry crashing through other geometry stretchy ugly textures and I just wanted to take a moment to say that's okay you know, embrace the mess. It kind of took me a while to be able to let go of the pursuit of always making like perfect clean models for everything I do. And while it's great to know how to do that and how to make good optimized models, especially if it's going to be something real time in your game, you know, this is for a pre-rendered sky. It really doesn't matter at all. And we only ever need to render a single frame of this. None of this mess will ever be visible to anyone and you know knowing when to 
just kind of let go and allow yourself to create without limitations, you'll save a ton of time and have a lot more fun in the process. But anyways, that aside, onto the camera setup. Uh, so first we'll place the camera in just the rough area where we want our scene in the game to be. I'm kind of imagining there's like a little market area or something over here under this outer plate. So I put the camera here and we want it to be roughly around the height of what the in-game camera will be. Like usually somewhere around the head height of our character. We'll just zero out the camera rotation, except in Blender it's kind of weird because that points the camera straight down, so we'll rotate that up 90 degrees. Uh, and then you can point your camera towards the focal point of your scene, but this doesn't really matter because we're rendering a full 360 degrees around the camera. It's just whatever is directly behind the camera will be where the texture uh, kind of seams. And from my experience, there's usually no visible seam, but just in case, I don't want to put that like directly in the middle of this focal point of the scene. So for the actual camera settings, we set the type to panoramic and switch it to equirectangular mode. Uh, HDRI panoramas like this should be saved in a format that supports high dynamic range, like EXR, and 16-bit is probably enough, and the resolution should be a 2 to 1 ratio. So just for this video, I'm rendering at 8K 8192 by 4096, which is probably overkill for a game. Uh, it does help to show the detail here, but you can definitely lower this and try to find that sweet spot where the quality still holds up, but without killing your performance. Uh, and then after the render is done, let's bring it into Godot. So now over here in Godot, we'll make a new 3D scene and click these three dots up here to add the default world environment node. And by default, it comes with its own procedural sky already set up, but we'll clear that out so that we can set up our own. So we'll just open up this environment and then down under sky, we'll swap out the sky material for a panorama sky material. And then we'll just drag our render over here. And there we go, it's basically that easy. Uh, you wanna make sure your color space matches whatever you were using in Blender. For me, it's AGX. And then I just made this uh, super quick gray box scene using the CSG nodes, just to get a feel for what it looks like in game, as well as to help set up our lighting. Uh, so in order to kind of tie together our sky dome and our foreground scene, we'll need to add a sunlight and try to match a similar sun color intensity and direction. Uh, we can just look at the shadows to kind of judge where the sun should be. And then we'll add a very slight fog to kind of match it into that same world. And then adding some like subtle bloom and other effects can help bridge the gap and get everything to feel a bit more cohesive. Now I think it looks pretty good when we're just standing still, but if we drop in a test character and start walking around, you might notice that when we start to move, something feels a little off, and that's due to the parallax. The uh, Sky Dome obviously has no parallax, as it's just a flat image mapped to this infinitely huge sphere, and the foreground scene obviously has plenty of parallax, so we need to kind of bridge this gap as well. And this is just as simple as adding some more objects in the background. Uh, we just need more layers. So it's not like a jarring jump between extreme foreground and extreme background. So for now, I'll just drop in some more CSG cylinders and move them around. And that should help it feel a lot better. But a common practice in games is to use like a lower level of detail object in the far background or even render some uh, distant objects onto cards and just place them around to populate your scene. Now if you want to use this sky dome on your own project you can grab it for free at the link below and it comes with four lighting variations for dawn, noon, dusk, and night and you can feel free to use them with or without credit in any project you want. Thanks for watching to the end and for those of you following me for the pixel art stuff my next video will be more of that with a focus on environments. Anyways, Hope you learned something new. Until next time.